Would you like me to keep talking? Oh.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Creekwood United Methodist Church, where we are growing deep roots to share God's love. We are so glad that you've decided to join us online again for our worship service this morning. We are so excited to be rolling out a new sermon series. I'm perhaps the most excited about it. Uh, we're going to be doing the Beatitudes on Broadway. If you're wondering what in the world a Beatitude is, that will be covered later. No worries on that. But we are going to be looking through some of our favorite musicals as we um, look at one of Jesus' His most important sermons. Be sure and greet one another in the comments as you have done so many weeks in the past. We're so grateful for the ways in which you all are being hospitable and welcoming to one another. And don't forget to register your attendance at creekwoodumc.org slash register. Our full band is back today, and so they are going to lead us in song to begin with. Thank you. 
thank you so much for that um, uplifting music this morning. We are so grateful to have you all here and with us this morning. And for those of you who are joining online, I hope that you stood up. I hope that you sang at the top of your lungs. Uh, I hope that if you didn't do that, you might do it on the next song. Uh, don't forget, there's no embarrassment in singing at home. Every noise this morning is a joyful noise to the Lord. Even if you're one of those off-key people, um, that's totally fine right now. Um, would you please join me in prayer? Gracious and most loving God, we thank you for the ability to gather again once more. We thank you for the technology that allows us to gather safely with some of us at home. God, we thank you for the ways that we've been able to connect with one another during this time. God, even when we're tired of Zoom calls, we thank you for Zoom. And we thank you for FaceTime. God, we thank you for the people who are in our houses that we might be tired of, that we might be fighting with. But we thank you for their love and we thank you for this extra time with them. God, today we ask for your forgiveness. In the places where we have not seen our neighbors as people made in your divine image. God, we repent of these times that we have seen your children as less than. God, we pray for the leaders who are trying to change the world. We're trying to continue to bring about your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. We ask that we might continue to find the ways to step out and to show your love to this world. It's in your name that we pray all of these things and we pray the words that Jesus taught us saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This crown with glory now, the Savior now to wash our feet. Now at his feet we bow The one who wore our sin and shame Now robed in majesty for all to to cry. 
body there would not remain Cause our God is round the Good morning! It's time for children's time. So I'm going to ask all of you to come forward to your TV or to your computer screen and um, get comfy cozy because we got some good stuff to talk about today. So Jesus was a wonderful teacher and took every single opportunity that he could to share special messages with all the people. One day, there were a lot of people gathered, and Jesus was there too. He had something special to say, and he wanted all of the people to be able to hear him, but most importantly, see him and hear him, both of those. So Jesus walked up to the top of a hill, or to the side of the hill, and he took a seat, and he began teaching how to be blessed and how to live a blessed life. This is called the Sermon on the Mount. You may have heard of that. So let me ask you, have you ever heard of the Beatitudes? Some of you may be raising your hand. Yes, 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 Ms. Allison, I have heard that. I have. And some of you may be going, huh? Be what? Okay, so let me tell you the word again. But I really want you to listen hard. Beatitudes. You might hear a couple words in there, so let's break it apart real quick so we can better understand it. The first word that I said was be. So it's like how we're going to be. Are we happy? Are we sad? Are we good? Are we not so bad? Those are all the things plus more. That's be. The second part is the word attitudes. I'm thinking you might have heard your mom and dad say attitudes before. Sometimes attitudes can be good, and maybe they can be not so good sometimes. So it just kind of depends on the situation. But when we put the two words together, we have beatitudes. So that is the attitudes we should be to live blessed. And Jesus preached several that day. But today, we're going to talk about just one. So one of them that Jesus says is, blessed are the meek. Wow, that's another super big word. In fact, you might be asking, did Miss Allison say weak? Nope, I did not say weak. I said meek, like M&Ms, meek. But funny that you ask if I said weak, because if you were to look up the meaning of the word meek, you would probably see the word weak. 
today. But back in the day when Jesus was teaching all the people, the word meek did not mean weak. What Jesus was telling the people then and is telling us now is to be teachable. Meek meant to be teachable, polite, patient, and fair, and lots of other things. Jesus was also saying that when we are meek, we trust God fully, and we know that God is with us all the time. Now, I don't know about you guys, actually, I think you probably would agree with me, that that is such a comforting feeling to know that God is right there, right here, with us all the time through every moment of our lives, every single step of the way. That is pretty awesome. Now, you might be wondering, why in the world is Miss Allison wearing those crazy orange starred sunglasses? Well, the first reason is that any chance that Miss Allison is given a chance to dress up or have fun, she's all in. I mean, I'll just go all in with you guys, so just know that from the start. But the real reason is that Pastor David is going to be talking about mus a musical today called Jesus Christ Superstar. So I want you to be sure to stick around and listen to what Pastor David has to say. But when I saw these glasses, I thought, oh, that totally says Jesus Christ Superstar. Because Jesus really is our superstar. In my life, in your life, we get to learn so much from Jesus. How to be with God, how to act, how to love, and how to share Jesus with all. And it is because of Jesus that we get to spend eternity with Jesus and God in heaven forever. So today, we are truly going to talk about Jesus being our superstar. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Jesus, we know we are so loved by you. Here we are learning again more ways to be our best self the best child, and learning the best ways that we can share you with all the people. In your name we pray, amen. Y'all have a great day. I saw in the uh, comment section while Miss Allison was giving her children's time that there is now a campaign to get everybody a matching pair of sunglasses. Um, rumor has it Miss Allison will be having uh, all different kinds of headgear for our sermon series through the different musicals. So stay tuned. You have no idea what could be next week. Um, we are so grateful for Miss Allison and all of the great work that she's doing um, with that. And uh, as we move into a time of offering, I want to remind you about online giving at creekwoodumc.org slash give if you're having any problems with that. Um, David or Rusty is, are more than happy to help you with that as well as uh, come and get your checks themselves or find any other way you'd like to send them, uh, we are happy to take that. And we are so grateful for your continued generosity during this time and the ways in which um, the ministry of the church has not stopped. The church has never been closed. Um, we have been continuing to work and continuing to love God's people through all the different things that we're doing, especially as we continue to respond to the needs around us. So we thank you so much for that. As you continue offering, I want to remind you of just a couple of announcements as we continue um, in this time of social distancing as um, we are coming up with new ways to connect with one another. Um, this Friday, we're going to have a concert in the parking lot. We are so excited about this. The Mojo Kings are going to be here um, as well as Andy's frozen custard ice cream truck thing. Um, it's going to be fantastic. We're so excited. So come on out. Bring a camping chair on Friday night right here in the parking lot here at church. There's no need to RSVP for that. Just come as you are. We'll be so excited to see you and to fellowship with you. On June 16th, uh, Me Casina Truck is going to be here at Creekwood as well for another uh, Food Trucks for Feeding Allen event. So with this, we need you to pre-order your food. And this is very important. So please uh, go to creekwoodumc.org slash food truck. You'll find a link to the Sign Up Genius. We know that the date at the top of the Sign Up Genius is wrong. Don't worry. The one on the website that's for June 16th is the right one. You'll see that. It's really important that we get those signups in early for Mi Casina, so be sure and just do that today. Do it right now while I'm talking. Uh, that way you can have that done and knocked off your list. We have loved getting to see you all come through our drive-thrus for this, and we'll be so excited to have Mi Casina here 
as well. Um, hopefully you saw this week on your news and notes emails, the amazing Grace Race has launched, and this is something for our youth ministry, for middle school ministries, for families, for everyone. Um, and Donna has put together this really cool scavenger hunt that's going to be happening throughout the month. So if you're interested in getting more details on that, she is definitely the person to contact. Another exciting thing that launched this week is the family mission projects for June. Um, the sign up for that, Katrina is going to post the link for the sign up for that. There's all kinds of different projects with all kinds of entry levels and all kinds of interest pieces for people to engage in taking treats to homebound members, helping clean up some yard work, working with different um, food drives and outreach opportunities. We are so grateful to our family ministry team for continuing to put forth so many great new and innovative ideas so we can continue to engage together in that. So you can contact Katrina for details on that. Our scripture reading for this morning, we actually have two that we're going to be reading from. And so the first is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Sorry, I'm using your Bible. This is good. This gives everybody time to find it themselves. So this is Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. It said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And the second is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us say, thanks be to God. Je m'appelle Francine Christophe. Je suis née le 18 août 1933. 1933, c'est l'année où Hitler prend le pouvoir. Voilà. C'est mon étoile. Je la porte sur la poitrine, bien entendu, comme tous les juifs. C'est gros, n'est-ce pas Surtout sur une poitrine d'enfant, puisque j'ai 8 ans à ce moment-là. Il s'est passé dans mon camp de Bergen-Belsen quelque chose de tout à fait extraordinaire. Je rappelle que nous étions des enfants de prisonniers de guerre et à ce titre privilégiés. Donc nous avions eu le droit d'emporter de France un petit, un petit sac avec deux, trois petites choses. Une femme, un petit bout de chocolat, une femme, un petit morceau de sucre, une femme, une petite poignée de riz. Maman avait emporté deux petits morceaux de chocolat. Et elle me disait, on garde ça pour le jour où je te verrai vraiment, complètement, par terre, fichu. Je te donnerai ce chocolat, il t'aidera peut-être à remonter. Or, il y avait parmi nous une femme qui avait été déportée alors qu'elle était enceinte. Ça ne se voyait pas, évidemment, elle était si maigre. Mais n'empêche que le jour de l'accouchement est arrivé et elle est partie au revire accompagnée de ma mère qui était notre chef de baraque. Et avant de partir, ma mère me dit « Tu te souviens que je garde un morceau de chocolat ?»« Oui, maman. »« Comment te sens-tu »« Bien, maman, ça peut aller. »« Alors si tu me le permets, ce morceau de chocolat, je lui apporterai » à notre amie Hélène, parce qu'un accouchement ici, elle va peut-être mourir. Et si je lui donne le chocolat, ça l'aidera peut-être. Oui, maman, tu le prends. Hélène a accouché, elle a accouché d'un bébé. Toute petite chose malingre. Elle a mangé le chocolat, elle n'est pas morte. Et elle est revenue dans la baraque. Le bébé n'a jamais pleuré, jamais, pas même jeun. Au bout de six mois, la libération est arrivée, on a défait tous ces chiffons, le bébé a crié. C'était là, 
sa naissance. Nous l'avons ramené en France. Tout petit truc de six mois, minuscule. Il y a quelques années, ma fille me dit, maman, si vous aviez eu des psychologues ou des psychiatres à votre retour, ça se serait mieux passé pour vous. Je dis sûrement, mais il n'y en avait pas. Plus personne n'y a pensé, même s'il si y en avait eu. Mais tu me donnes une bonne idée. On va faire une conférence là-dessus. J'ai organisé une conférence sur le thème « Et s'il y avait eu des psy en 1945 à notre retour de camp, comment est-ce que ça se serait passé ?» J'ai eu beaucoup de monde. Des anciens, des survivants, des, des curieux. Et puis beaucoup de psychologues, psychiatres, psychothérapeutes, tout ce monde avait eu. Très intéressant. Chacun avait son idée, c'était très bien. Et puis il y a une femme qui est arrivée et qui a dit « Moi, j'habite Marseille, je suis médecin psychiatre. Et avant de vous faire ma communication, j'ai quelque chose à donner à Francine Christophe, c'est-à-dire à moi. » Elle fouille dans sa poche, elle sort un morceau de chocolat, elle me le donne et elle me dit « Je suis le bébé ». pointed out um, the definition in the actual dictionary for today the, uh, of meek, it says um, humbly patient or docile as under uh, provocation. And I think in the video, it gives us a good question to ask meek to who? Uh, certainly with historical circumstances, we would see how the Nazis invaded France. They would see what the Nazis did uh, and all the atrocities to the Jewish people and others that they sent to these camps. And we would say that Uh, this woman was meek before the Nazis, but what we see in this defiant action of humility is that meek does not equal weak. And I would really question whether she was meek before the Nazis or she was meek before her God. Because I would argue that in this act of humility, she strikes out against the Nazis' own brand of death. She strikes out against death and makes life happen. She brings life to this earth the same way that we are called to in the name of Jesus Christ, who is described in Philippians as the epitome of meek. It is not always how we talk about Jesus. We, especially as Protestants, love the superhero, superstar Jesus who can conquer everything and walk through walls. But in Philippians 2, it says the mind of Christ is the epitome of meekness, is the epitome of humility. It's not weakness, it's meekness. The mind of Christ is the epitome of humility And it says that he was given all power in the kingdom of heaven by God because of the humble attitude he took in giving himself up for us on a cross. And we're encouraged to do this in the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's one of the first things mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount in these Beatitudes is that the meek will inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And it's not the only time that Jesus lifts this up as an attitude of humility that we as followers of Jesus are supposed to follow to and adhere to very closely if we want to see the world that we'd like to inherit. And the story in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke of the rich young ruler, sometimes he's called a lawyer, and he wants to follow Jesus. And I think it's kind of for his own resume, his own credibility. Uh, but Jesus turns around and says, you need to give up the chocolate that is most precious to you. You need to give up the thing that you are holding on to for your value that gives you the authority and the power over others. I want you to give everything that you have to the poor, and then you can come follow me. And I think his true intentions were revealed, and he doesn't end up following along with Jesus. Later in Matthew and Luke, we have these parables called the parable of the wedding feast or the parable of the wedding banquet. Uh, there's multiple different stories of these, or multiple different parables that associate with feasts like this. But uh, in one specifically, um, Jesus is uh, telling a story of somebody throwing a wedding feast. And wedding feasts were usually lavish, opulent events that you wanted to inherit. You wanted to be part of the best feast that someone had to offer. And yet, 
when they went around town and they invited the best and the brightest and the superstars in their community, all of them had better things to do. What was most precious to them was their time in this factor. If the rich young ruler was obsessed with resources, these people were obsessed with their time or their importance. They didn't want to deign to make an appearance at just another wedding feast. They'd had enough of those. And so Jesus then tells the story where he says, well, forget those people. We're going to go out into the streets and the alleyways, and we're going to invite the nobodies of the world. And they're going to come and dine at the feast because they will appreciate the humility, or in their humility, they will appreciate what God is giving to them. Even very specific passage in John chapter 12, verse 24, we read this at funerals often, but it ought to apply to our lives as well. It says, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. See, I think we really appreciate the version of the gospel that makes us healthy, wealthy, and wise. I think we really appreciate the gospel that forgives our sins so that we can go be superstars. I think we even secretly love the gospel that uplifts us better than other people. But the majority of the gospel is this call for meekness and this call for humility, this call to make ourselves uncomfortable with All the power that we try and gain, all the resources we try and gain, all the time that we try and keep, it's supposed to make us uncomfortable and upset our structure a little. And we're not always the most comfortable with that version of Jesus. I remember when I did the sermon series, some of you who weren't here, we did a sermon series called Christianity's Family Tree, where I went around to different parts of Allen and McKinney and some into Frisco and Uh, interview different faith leaders from different Christian denominations, kind of building up on the historical lineage of what we have as Methodists as well as what we share as Christians. And I remember off camera, I always had a few conversations with them that were some of the more touchy subjects. And um, off camera, I was sitting with a Catholic priest. And for those of you who have been to a church like Creekwood or any Protestant church, which basically means non-Catholic, Uh, you walk in and the cross that is hanging in every Protestant church across the world will be an empty cross. It'll usually be big, but it'll be empty. And and it's supposed to signify like the resurrection, that Jesus is off the cross, but the cross enters us into resurrection. It's that powerful move to where we get to take authority. Uh, And and there's some good parts of that. But I I remember we were taking a tour through St. Gabriel's Church up in McKinney, and we're walking through, and I just, I saw, because if you walk into any Catholic church, You won't find an empty cross. You will find Jesus in the midst of the agony of crucifixion staring down at you. And a lot of people will look at that and just say, it's another part of Catholic guilt. They do it well, ambiance-wise and everything. But I remember looking at the Father and I said, "Um, why do you leave him up there? Why in every Catholic church across the world, why is it so different? Why do you leave Jesus up there to suffer and die? Why not celebrate the resurrection? And he looked at me very matter-of-factly and said, why are you afraid of seeing him up there? Because there's this attitude that we tend to have, especially in Protestant circles, where we don't want to talk about the agony. We love the story of Jesus dying for us, but we really love the for us part. We really love what it does for us. And I would challenge us all to think about if our church wasn't meeting every need that we had, would we still go and be faithful servants? If we didn't like the music that week, if we didn't like the sermon that week, if the pastor upset us a little bit, if the people around us upset us a little bit, would we still be faithful to that? Or are we going to go church shop and are we going to find some place that's just going to tell us exactly what we want to hear? Are we looking for something that makes us strong or are we looking at somebody who makes us weak so that we can be strong together? This is not a new phenomenon of not wanting to be weak. Culturally, it has never been accepted to be weak, and we confuse meekness with weakness. It has never been uh, associated as strong to be weak. In fact, the very first rendering that we have of Jesus in any kind of artwork is is from around 200 AD, maybe 250 AD, and it was inscribed on a Roman wall near Palatine Hill. It's called the Alexa Mamos uh, Graffito, and you can uh, see it on the screen. The Alexa Mamos Graffito, it's graffiti, um, starring uh, or making fun of uh, possibly another Roman soldier named Alexa Mamos. And what it has in this picture is Alexa Mamos, assuming this Roman guard, who is lifting his hand up to worship this man slash donkey in a throwback to the crucifixion story of the Palm Sunday story on a cross. And, and the inscription in there says, Alexa Mamos worships his God. 
And in no way should this be taken as just a historical fact that Alexa Mamos was a Roman guard who converted to Christianity and everyone was proud of him. This was inscribed as graffiti on Palatine Hill where all the Roman uh, governors and authorities live. It's right across from the, the Colosseum. It's where the important people live. And it was graffiti to make fun of another guard. It was graffiti to shame Alexa Mamos because who is foolish in their right mind to worship somebody who dies? Who is foolish in their right mind to think that a God who is supposed to be all-powerful amongst the world would subject himself to death on a cross? It is absolute ridiculousness. And so we tend to take Jesus off the cross. We tend to take Jesus away from suffering. And we talk about how he is all-powerful and in, in, in resurrection truly is all-powerful. But we don't stop and follow the lineage of Scripture. That even in the letters of Paul, it says we're going to suffer. And maybe not suffer martyrdom. But life is going to be harder. Because when faced with a choice of going to a Nazi concentration camp and having two little glimmers of hope in those two pieces of chocolate and having your own enjoyment versus another woman's survival, Jesus calls us to choose the other person's survival every time. Jesus calls us to give our lives for the lives of others, to be meek, and humble in the way that we will follow the molding teachings of Jesus. And this is where Jesus Christ Superstar is a really effective witness to our world. The first time I saw it was, I mean, like two decades ago almost. Um, and I remember uh, not really taking it all in, but fortunately I got to see this uh, 2008 version that is striking. And I want to tell you that if you don't like having your assumptions of who Jesus is challenged, the Jesus Christ Superstar is probably not for you. Um, it, it opens up to scenes of like Occupy with London and Occupy Wall Street with, with the disciples with a hashtag of follow the 12 standing up against the oppressive Wall Street bankers and, and everything. And it's really this counter. I mean, Peter has an anarchy symbol shaved into the side of his head. It, it is not for the faint of heart for those of you who like whitewashed Swedish Jesus with a beauty sash marching down the beach or for those of you who think Jesus is just a really nice guy. Uh, and that's why Jesus Christ Superstar is effective is because it challenges every notion of Jesus that we have. It reminds us of Jesus who turned the tables when things were unjust and people were getting ripped off. It reminds us of Jesus who does walk straight up into the face of the Jewish leaders and the Roman consuls and challenges the societal ills of their day. It reminds us of the strength of Jesus, but it also reminds us of the meekness of Jesus. Because amongst this big flurry of activity, I mean, the opening probably 30 minutes tell you everything you need to know about the Jesus character and Jesus Christ superstar. Uh, here you've got the, the actual main character is probably Judas of the story. Uh, Judas walks in, and this version he's got dreadlocks, which is pretty awesome. And, and he walks in, uh, but Judas's main concern in Jesus Christ superstar is that Jesus is drawing too much unnecessary attention to their movement. That he's speaking out too much. He, wants, he thinks Jesus is trying to be too much of a superstar. In fact, he, he asked Jesus to check his own ego at the door for the sake of the movement. It, historically, I would say that's probably not right. Historically, I would say Judas was actually upset at who Jesus was. That, that Jesus wasn't going far enough in his militarism. He wasn't going far enough in just actually taking the throne for the kingdom or for the Jewish kingdom as Judas wanted it to be. And then we see Judas throw... Or, to see Judas, Judas take the money and betray Jesus. It's Mary Magdalene, I think, who frames up the story so well in this song that she sings it's called, I Don't Know How to Love Him. Because he's supposed to be a superstar. He's supposed to be this all-conquering king. He's supposed to be King David riding in on a, a, a war horse, not a donkey. He's supposed to be King David who comes in and takes Jerusalem back for his people, even Peter. Peter, in, Peter, with his anarchy symbol and everything, uh, sings this song. And I remember listening to it as I'm watching, and Carrie Lynn had the same reaction. Like, we, we both heard this song about, Jesus, you will have all the praise and the glory and honor. I thought, we could sing this song in church. This is an amazing song. It's a song we would sing on Easter to praise this triumphant Jesus, this superstar Jesus. And, and as soon as Peter is done with it, he looks at Jesus, and Jesus looks him straight in the eye, and in a musical rendition of saying, get behind me, Satan, as he does in Scripture, he says, what do you know of glory? What do you really know of power? that they all want Jesus to take the throne. Kind of like the Israelites were clamoring Samuel for a king. And Samuel is like, do you know how this is going to be bad for you? 
all the prohibitions in Deuteronomy about you wanting a king, the, the king's going to enslave you, the king's going to take your horses, the king's going to take your property. Do you know how bad this is going to get for you if you just rely on this one superstar? Because Jesus, every single time Judas challenges him, every time Peter uplifts him, every time Mary Magdalene sings to him, every time this crowd, this movement wants him to be the martyr, wants him to be the superstar, every time they want him to be glorious here on earth, he always turns it around and he says, no, this is about you. He always turns it around to a Pentecost moment and says, no, I'm going to give you my spirit. And the words Jesus uses in scripture are that you will do even greater things than I will. Not because we're more powerful than Jesus, not because we're part of the Trinity like Jesus, but because there's more of us. And while Jesus was one person and could accomplish miracles that I don't know if I'll ever dream of partaking in, through the Holy Spirit, I get the responsibility humbly to go and continue Jesus' work, and so do you. And however many people are participating in worship across the world right now, however many people didn't participate around the world, but they're still claiming Jesus as their Savior, we have this humble gift, this humble responsibility. See, this is where Jesus says we'll inherit the earth. Because if we're always looking for a superstar, then that ball only stays in their court. If we're seeking to be the superstar, well, we're never going to live up to the responsibility that we have. Jesus Christ superstar challenges whether we're willing to follow Jesus in sharing the power of heaven or whether we just want to dress up Jesus to look like we want Jesus to look like and call it good. In response to everything that's going on in our country and around the world right now, the one thing that I was reflecting on in light of the meek shall inherit the earth is I wish that we had listened to the meek. Before it went into active protest, before things were destroyed, before lives were lost, I don't really wish we had any martyrs. I wish we didn't have to say the name of Ahmaud Arbery. I wish we didn't have to say the name of Brianna. I wish we didn't have to say the name of Asians who have been kicked because of people's assumptions that COVID were there. I wish there, David Dorn, the police officer, wasn't killed. I wish we didn't have martyrs on either side because I wish we had listened to the meek. The meek in their humility who were trying to tell us that something was amiss. The meek amongst us who were trying to tell us that the kingdom was not here on earth as it is in heaven. I wish that we'd listened to the meek voices and I wish that we had allowed the meek to inherit the earth and that we had joined alongside them and become allies in peace. That's why I think Jesus, the mind of Christ, is in Philippians. Is this mind that is humble enough to listen when things aren't bad, but humble enough to listen when things are good. Humble enough to listen that in the prosperity that we enjoy and that we share, we would still listen to those who don't share that prosperity, black, white, Asian, whoever. And I'm really excited about this initiative. I was at the Collin County Prayer Rally with Carrie Lynn, Mary Beth Hardesty Crouch, and Jessica Wright from First Allen were there. And there were just, there were preachers and pastors and clergy and probably about 5,000 people from all over Collin County that came. And, and it wasn't a political rally, it was a prayer rally. We invoked the name of God over the sins of this world. We called for justice to rain down. Not our, I mean, I would say somewhat our human justice, but I would say that human justice is flawed. We asked for God's justice. All right, we asked for God's justice to be there. And the way that it was called to manifest was this beautiful idea that I believe came out of one community church called Unity Table. And I want to invite you to this. I'll, I'll reference it in this Wednesday email that I sent out, but it's inviting us to be meek not weak, inviting us to be meek and strong enough and brave enough that every fifth Sunday we would sit down and eat with somebody that doesn't look like us. Uh, maybe it's a gay couple. Maybe it's a straight couple. Maybe it's a woman. Maybe it's a man. Maybe it's an Asian couple. Maybe it's a black couple. Maybe it's a white couple. Maybe it's a Hispanic couple. Who knows what it looks like? Maybe it's uh, people who have Native American uh, lineage in there. Whoever it is, it's somebody with a different story than you have. And you might have the same stories in business, but you don't have the same stories in heredity. Maybe you have the same stories in heredity, but you don't have the same stories in schooling. Right? Every fifth Sunday, it's allowing ourselves to be humble enough to sit and eat and be vulnerable with somebody not like us so that diversity becomes normalized. And then we start to see diversity as beautiful, kind of as we talked about two weeks ago, or maybe it was last week. It becomes beautiful to sit down with people with different stories than we have. And then we get to learn from each other and we get to be meek together as opposed to separated violently. 
This is my call for us as the church. It's my hope for us as the church is that we don't need a superstar. We have one. His name is Jesus. And this is the only superstar I've ever known of who didn't want it. He kept trying to make us powerful. He kept trying to get us to see that if we will just share our chocolate, if we will share our power, if we will bend on our knees so that others may be uplifted, then we will inherit the world that God desires. And it's, I believe, what we not only remember, but celebrate and take part of when we celebrate communion together. Uh, we didn't tell you earlier, should, we gotten, should have got you ready earlier in the service for this, but uh, we're going to celebrate communion right now. And Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in God's ways to join at this communion table where several disciples who of different persuasions, I mean, we have Simon who is known as the zealot because he wanted to take Jerusalem by force. And then we have Matthew who was a tax collector who worked for the, the people, the Jewish leaders and the Roman leaders. Uh, people of different places who came from different places in Galilee who sat together at a table to unite under one common banner of Jesus Christ, of humility, of saying that they too were willing to put the other person's life in front of their own, and that that they felt like they believed strongly would help us inherit the kingdom that Jesus wanted us to inherit. So as we join in the great Thanksgiving together, I invite you, if you have a solid or a liquid, um, doesn't matter what it is, it'll work. The Holy Spirit can work in miraculous ways. And so I've heard anything from chips and salsa to Oreos and milk. And some people have stocked up on Hawaiian bread just for these very uh, particulars because we all know that King's Hawaiian is what Jesus used back in the day, um, along with Welch's grape juice. And so let us confess our sins together. You'll find the words on the screen. Um, let us confess our sins together as we humble ourselves before the only superstar of this world. Join with me. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. And it's through Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray, and all God's people said, amen. This is the part where you repeat with me because remember, we're doing this across camera with a few people in the sanctuary right now, but if you're not repeating with me, then we're not doing this together. And, and communion is meant to be done together. It is not meant to be done individually. And so through the power of the Spirit and technology, we're able to do this together. And so here are the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And this is where you would say back to me, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thank you for that. We all say glory to God. Amen. Now, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance 
of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and he feasts at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in your holy church all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever, and all God's people said together, Amen. If you have chosen to worship uh, with somebody else at your house, you've invited some other people or families over, I invite you to serve each other now. If you are by yourself, that is totally great as well. You can serve yourself, and the Holy Spirit is connecting us, so we are communing together to celebrate and live into the call to be Jesus' hands and feet as Jesus died and resurrected to make us the body of Christ. A few instructions is you maybe don't know how to do this. You uh, take the bread, um, either offer it to somebody or offer it to yourself in this case, and say, this is the body of Christ broken for you. You can dip it into the cup um, or whatever liquid you have and, this is, and offer it up. Say, this is the, the blood of Christ poured out for you. And dip it uh, in a manner called intinction. Dip it in the cup. Unite the two elements and then unite it in your soul and feel God's grace washing over you. If there are children in, uh, around who don't quite get the imagery of sacrifice uh, or body and blood in there, uh, feel free and just use the words, Jesus, this, is, this means Jesus loves you so much. Because really that's what we're trying to get at anyway for anybody who's, who's participating. Um, you can, uh, um, oh, the, the most important part in this is that um, this is not our table as Creekwood or our table as United Methodist, but it is the Lord's table. And so anyone participating, anybody who's streaming with us right now, anybody who is actively here in the sanctuary, meaning basically the band, um, everybody is welcome to come and take part in communion here today. And so we'll give you a few minutes to uh, serve, um, serve each other or serve yourself as we come and take communion here as well. Let's enjoy the feast. So, to come and take communion here. So it's always wonderful to celebrate communion together. Before we end our service, we're going to sing triumphantly one last time to the crucified God who was also the resurrected God who uh, invites us to humble ourselves but also lifts us up from that. So let's sing together. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope, no place to begin 
Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested, my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in him. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. Amen. I forgot earlier during communion, we always do a mission offering during communion, the hands and feet of Jesus Christ offering. And Carrie Lynn had sent an email, uh, at least to me, reminding me, and I forgot that that is going toward uh, that family mission opportunity for resources to empower families to go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. So if you go to creekwoodumc.org slash give and you hit online giving, there'll be a uh, scroll bar you can go to and you can click on mission giving. And anything that comes in today, we're going to give toward that family mission. So you can go back uh, to that website and you can give, but surely um, death was arrested through the humility of Christ. And we're so grateful for that as Christians that we get to live in eternity with Christ, but we also get to bring eternity here on earth in the way that we share our life with others. And so may you be somebody who shows what it really means to follow Jesus this week. May you show people and the world what it looks like to love God, love our neighbor, and love ourselves. We'll see you Wednesday for Bible study with our special guest, Marcus Jones, or we'll see you next week for worship. Have a great week, everybody.